Okay, this is probably the second of the latest um, series of videos that I'm going to try and record to talk about the project um, and to try to describe what it is that I can put up on a new Marginalia YouTube channel. I've come to a bit of a difficult cross in the roads, a different difficult junction right now in terms of what the project is and what the main focus of the project is. From the beginning, I think this project has been quite flexible, um, but really what it comes down to is what people are interested in seeing. And I've not given anybody a chance to decide that yet, aside from uh, my girlfriend. Um, and for my girlfriend, for the last few months, it has been pretty obvious what the project is. And that is this. This is, I don't know which draft this is now. I think I called it some like version 0.1.2 or something like that. This is Call Them Soldiers. Um, so it's a manuscript um, I've got here, I don't know, over 120 pages uh, of a typewritten manuscript. And I was probably working on this back in the summer. Um, it's amazing how quick the time goes. Um, <coughs> when you're working on something really that you really want to be working on, I've, I've worked very, very hard over the last few months and I haven't really almost noticed anything else. I haven't noticed the time passing, but it's February now. I started in July and there have been a couple of breaks since then, um, but that's inevitable. Call Them Soldiers is a project that goes back to, I guess, 2007, 2008. And that was a difficult time for me um, in a lot of ways. I have Asperger's Syndrome, I have ADHD, and I've not always been functional. In fact, I have rarely been functional in any way. Um, back then, I was in Great Britain. I had returned from my first time in Prague to Great Britain in 2005 and I worked with young adults with behavioural problems, with attention deficit disorder like me, with Asperger's syndrome like myself. Um, and the work was, it was pretty good work. It's for very little money, as you can probably imagine. Um, I think that's the case everywhere that has that kind of work. But I enjoyed it a lot and, and it was very important for me. At that time, it was a very strong community around there. There was people, um, essentially I'll describe what the project is. It's, it's um, or was, I hear it's not doing so well now, I guess with many, many years of austerity in, in Great Britain. It was a project that dealt with kids from tough backgrounds and with these kind of neurodevelopmental conditions uh, predominantly. Later on they took different people who would not accept it at mainstream schools. They worked in a variety of environments including a biodynamic it's called, um, that is organic plus voodoo as, as the kind of the farmer there used to say. Um, they worked on the farm they worked on in a woodlands and they worked in an old glass factory and they would blow glass there they would do cut glass and they would do a variety of workshops involved in crafts the the whole project went back to the idea of um, apprenticeships um, where kids would work with for example, a blacksmith or something like that. As indeed, I'm looking at the, the books back there, uh, Tege M, so Tomáš Garag, Garig Masaryk, um, the first president of an independent Czechoslovakia, worked initially in this kind of apprenticeship, um, even here in the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia as was. Uh, and in fact, at the time, I guess it was still the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. And... That gave people a kind of process of socialization was was the idea behind it and um, these kids would be would would it would help them to learn how to work with one another and 
also, in working with your hands, it gives you a sense of fulfilment. And the idea as well is that in working with your hands and developing your kind of um, fine motor skills and in learning a craft, it is essentially, um, it's character building. How else could you say that? Um, I can't think of the word I was looking for. And there was a lot to that. Um, Sometimes it was exaggerated, and there was a lot of pseudoscience knocking around. This was a Rudolf Steiner um, organization, and it was also a slight kind of home rolled philosophy was behind it as well. It was home rolled philosophy indeed by a an autistic thinker, and so the, there was. It could be pretty esoteric. Um, willfully obscure and a little bit crazy at times. There was a lot of kind of socio Scientology, sorry, kicking around um, a lot of the books of this, the founder of Scientology you could find there. But it was important to me. There were several distinct communities there and I still take this with me a lot now. And it really, if I started to analyse what some of my fiction is about, it would often go back there, I think, including Called and Soldiers. Um, indeed, the idea of Malfi sanctuaries probably resides in the idea of uh, the, the community in the woodlands, which was pretty rejectionist in terms of the, the anthros, meaning the anthro... Posifists, I think they call themselves, of the the Rudolf Steiner cult, essentially. It is a cult or a sect by many a stringent kind of sociological term. Uh, it's been a few years since I've looked into that in terms of the differences between cults and sects, but I think it was more the sect side of things. <coughs> the idea from Called and Soldiers came up, really, when I... Socially, I failed. I crashed out of society, as, essentially, as is typically the case with people who have um, Asperger's syndrome. It happens repeatedly sometimes. Major social failures, kind of car crashes, you could call them all this, in the figurative sense. And that happened to me then. Um, and the whole community turned against me, pretty much. Um, I was a bit of an outcast in one sense, or a bit of a weirdo. And so there was a kind of degree of, of, of paranoia involved in my thinking at the time. Um, you could examine the thinking of kind of Philip K. Dick or somebody like that and how that created, the, the how that led to their narratives uh, and their stories that came out of them. What was also happening at the time was Facebook was just moving and, and going straight through all of these communities. And it didn't matter really. Um, which communities it was. Some of the anthros were there on Facebook and they would have their anthro groups on Facebook and then it was it was a very, very strange type of, 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 of community because you had the, the blacksmiths and, and the craftspeople who no longer had a place in society. You then had the university-educated types who were kind of running... Um, they had done humanities and then studied social sciences and things like that, or simply gone into um, social work. And there was that side of it then. Um, and then there were the guys who would otherwise have been working any other kind of mug job, essentially. Um, they would take drugs on the weekend. Um, they were into all the music and stuff that was going on in my in my little town in the West Midlands where I'm from. But Facebook went through all of these different communities. And what I was seeing was suddenly these people, because I hadn't been able to do a lot of what these people were doing, going out and, um, and being with friends on the weekends. I just was always pretty much a recluse. Um, or incapable of doing that, all of that in any case. And suddenly you saw a lot of these people were 
talking about just staying in. What are you doing tonight? Well, I'm going to stay in, have a pizza, um, and they'll just be on Facebook. And you would see them then kind of doing, um, I think it was called Gangster Wars was one, or Mafia Wars, then Farmville and things like this. And they were all just interacting through the computer, which meant, of course, that instead of having this, this community, which is kind of horizontal, then it would first, your communication would, would first go into the hub and then back out again in order to travel that kind of minute geographical and social distance between the two people that you know from work. You're going right the way back into this kind of wheel hub and coming back again, even though then that means going to California and then back out, for example. Um, I don't know where kind of uh, Facebook servers were at that time. Um, it was absurd. And I started reading some of the... some of where Facebook had come from and where its funding had come from. Um, and back then I was pretty... I, I thought it was a very dangerous thing. I, I could see a lot of these trends like um, data mining coming. And of course, if you were to post things like that on Facebook, then first of all, you're... you're you're engaging with it in order to engage with those people because there's no other way to, to, to talk to everybody, it seemed at that time, than to go through Facebook. You, you were suddenly a pariah because you weren't or didn't know how to function socially on, on this network. Um, which I guess it was much of muchness. I didn't know how to function socially in any case. Um, so not knowing how to fun function socially on, on Facebook was something else. Um, in any case, then, I guess at the time I thought, oh, this is great though. I initially embraced it thinking that, well, um, I was reading about kind of Asperger's syndrome. I was reading about how um, interacting digitally could be great for people with Asperger's syndrome. And this is what a lot of people thought. And indeed, a lot of these services are actually invented by people who are more towards the, um, the autistic spectrum than is typically the case, or they were on the, the autistic spectrum. And... I started, I guess, to put together, and I don't know where it first came from. At the time, I was working on a number of um, short stories. I had quit my job, and I was working there for a number of months. I was com a complete recluse. I'd had a complete breakdown, essentially, at the time. Um, I was working on a typewriter, much like this one, <coughs> on a series of, of short stories called, at the time, Liquid Loves. Um, and I figured that that came from two things, Milan Kundera and his laughable loves, and then uh, Zygmunt Bowman uh, and his liquid love. Um, both of which I had probably neither, I had n read neither of them probably. Um, certainly not thoroughly so. But some of that analysis, in any case, in terms of Zygmunt Bowman, worked its way into Call Them Soldiers. And indeed, the, the, the title, Call Them Soldiers, comes from a quote that I found in a, an early piece, I think, by Zygmunt Bowman about um, the British thinker and utilitarian um, Jeremy Bentham. And he was basically saying, call them soldiers, call them monks, call them soldiers, but that they were happy I don't mind, or something like that. I, I don't remember the, um, the, the, the pure quote, um, the exact quote. Essentially then, it's, even from the beginning, I was imagining forward to a time um, where England, and I spoke of England, I think, even from the beginning, as England rather than as Great Britain. Um, there's a kind of imperialist sense that it is only about England and that the other identities just don't exist. And there was a sense then that everybody was being controlled and that um, we were living in this, essentially this panopticon where um, everybody is being watched and being watched, most people are very concerned to do the things that they should be seen to do. And they are manipulated in that way. They also live their lives through what was then called the conduit and is now called the eudaemon. 
Um, I don't know how to pronounce the original Greek word, it's eudaimonia, I think it was, which means kind of well-being or something like that. And the eudaimon is, comes from two things, eudaimonia, the um, Greek philosophical um, concept of the well-being of the polis and the well-being of the individual, I think both, and a daemon, which functions in the background. It's a background process in a computer. And the eudaemon is a background process which runs essentially all of the citizens and it, and it enables them, it says, to talk to one another and to communicate with one another. And it seems to offer so much in terms of this communication, but it's always that very much that um, the wheel network, which has a central hub and everything has to go into the central hub and then back out again. Meaning that um, everything is understood, everything is mapped. Um, the elites have the power to, to see precisely what it is in their power to do or precisely what they need to do in order to sell a given idea to the populace. Um, that is very much de developed then, um, essentially over 10 years. It was developed essentially in a demon in my own mind, so that the Call Them Soldiers remained from that period. Um, it wasn't possible to write it at the time, and because I have these problems with ADHD, uh, attention deficit disorder, I've always been pretty marginal, and I've always been moving around. And it's simply not been possible either because of my state of mind or because of my situation, but usually both, um, to write consistently. And there is a problem as well because I always have moved from one thing to another to another all of the time. And several years ago that was much worse than it is now, but it still kind of remains the case. I have a problem sticking to one thing. What is novel takes my attention. Um, also what I don't understand takes my attention. And I want to talk a little bit about that today. Um, this then is the, as I say, maybe the second draft, something like that, of the first <coughs> book of Call Them Soldiers. Back in the summer when it came alive again, and I was kind of surprised that it came alive again, and I was kind of surprised to see that this is what I want to work on. Um, but when it came alive again, it really had developed so much over those 10 years, um, I guess that's difficult to actually describe because these demons, basically everything runs at once in my head. Um, there's a constant noise and it's as if there's a series of television channels and you can just flick between them, but it's as if somebody's just zapping through these channels in my head all of the time. Now, many years ago, I remember when television was maybe four channels, then it was five channels, well, and each had a certain character, but each had a number of programs. And that's kind of how my head feels. But year upon year, month upon month, even week upon week, the channels increases and the number of programs increases, and then you still get the repeats, and then you still get whatever. Column Soldiers was only one of those processes, one of those channels, one of those programs over that period. And in, in the meantime, I've had everything else. So I don't know if you can see up here, I can point out kind of learning Python. I've got a number of books here, um, which really my interests have only expanded and I continue to be interested in each of those things. Um, and they just, it just opens up another channel. Um, and sometimes, now and again, I'll pop back and forth. And sometimes I have, maybe I'll get into watching two of the 128 channels, and then a little later on, I'll be flicking regularly through the seven, and not quite seven of them, um, of, of different favourites, and not quite settle into one or another, and so on. Call on Soldiers was always there, I was always aware of it, but I wasn't aware that all of this time it was kind of developing. Now... When it's your own head, it's strange how you are the viewer, perhaps, but also um, 
Well, there's, there's a process in there that all the time these programs are changing. They're kind of developing, or rather there's, there's more series going on. I don't even know how I could describe it. But certainly in that time, though, I wasn't aware of actually working on the, on the piece. It was constantly developing. And if you imagine in that time, so I guess you can see a couple of different things here. One of them is Edward Snowden. Even if you're not doing anything wrong, you are being watched and recorded, he says here. And here is Aaron Schwartz. Um, information is power, but like all power, there are those who want to keep it for themselves. In this period of the last few years, um, Edward Snowden came out. Now, the Edward Snowden revelations were not such a revelation to myself or anybody who had been aware as I say, from back in kind of 2007 and 8, when Facebook first really started to come up, I was aware of what some of those trends were in Web 2.0 or whatever you want to call it. Um, it was more closed, it was more corporate, and it involved a lot of surveillance, essentially, this Web 2.0. Um, and I didn't really know Web 1.0 or whatever we're going we're gonna to call it, the first stages of, um, of the Web. And so I guess Edward Snowden and all of these kind of trends, so Creative Commons is in there as well, um, free and open source software is in there somewhere. And all of this uh, analysis that I picked up by becoming obsessed with a lot of these different things went into what this is now, you know? Um, and this, as I say, is just book one of what became several books. Now, this is a problem, and it brings us to this dilemma that I'm facing now. Book one I was working on, and then it's essentially, Call Them Soldiers as a whole is very claustrophobic. It's just set in Manchester. Um, Manchester essentially is now the, the home, really, of um, this new contractual parliamentary system that you have in, in England with um, these with, with this kind of AI, this, this artificial intelligence and um, the, the, the UD and, and this incredible incredibly powerful way of manipulating the populace. And what I felt was there's a lot of technical detail in there and even though I thought it was precisely the kind of novel that we need at the minute to understand these kind of um, issues that we're facing, the problem is that I can also see that most people aren't educated at all about any of these things. And I got so much into it that it's really quite technical, this, 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 some of these aspects of, of the novel, and it might be hard to, to follow. But also, it, it focuses right down into Manchester. What I then became obsessed by, and this might be one of this problematic, these problematic trends that I have, which is to, to move towards the new, um, to be fascinated by something else and to move on. Now, for, for me, kind of Call Them Soldiers, I guess, was finished. You know, I've got all the characters, they were living, I was obsessed by them, they were inside of my head. But is it the case that before I've written the fifth draft and the sixth draft, I was alternating from computer to, to typewritten drafts and so on. Um, before I've moved on to doing those, um, has the project closed to me? I, I, has it just become boring to me? So did I move on before I honed it and really got it down? And do I always do that? Is it all for me just about finishing it in my own head? It's interesting, me until, interesting to me until I complete it. I've thought the way through it. Um, and with ADHD, there's always the possibility of that, and that's one of the things I'm worried about. So even though I can now, I can now do this. There was years ago I could finish, you know, barely two paragraphs in several sittings, and I wouldn't get anywhere. Now I can do all of this, but is it always the case that I'll just write these rough drafts, then another rough draft, and then I finished it in my head and I'm done? Because the next step then was to that's call them soldiers, book one, think soldier. This is the 
continuation. It's the second chapter of the... This is book one, and this is uh, the narrative frame for the entire Corgan Soldiers sequence. And this is called History is on the Make, which I haven't yet described. Um, this then, and I've got a lot of mixed feelings about this. Um, this follows a number of individuals from the Choctaw Nation in America. Now, what I decided we needed, or what I decided was needed in this fictional world, is a narrative frame. Now, I've used narrative frames for many, many years. I don't know when I started to do it, but I kind of, I guess I read about even um, Chaucer and a number of these others, very, very, going back to the uh, early days of kind of written literature. Uh, I read about some of these narrative flames, frames that were, these frame stories that were written back then, in, including the Canterbury Tales. And the Decameron and things like that. <coughs> and I became obsessed by that back when I was 17. It's 20 years ago. But it revisited this as well. And I initially thought that it would be a quick kind of um, forward or a preface, I, I can't remember the differences between them and what it should be, um, to the Call Them Soldiers sequently, sequence. And then I got into it and realised that actually, no, what, what happens is, if we're in 2060, um, the thing about writing about Manchester in England was that it was very closed down and it was closed to the rest of the world. Um, when I revisited this, and the reason I was revisiting it is because of, I guess, a lot of the dystopian and almost fascist, well not almost fascist, the fascist elements of what we're seeing in the trends in the world today, we can see history is really, it's waking up. Um, we believed in the end of history, it's not, and now we can feel forces that um, a whole renegotiation of the geopolitical situation that has been relatively stable since the Second World War. It's a stability that's only observed from certain places like the, the <coughs> fortunate places in Europe, such as even Prague from, from, from 1989, uh, we thought. And so with Brexit, Call of Soldiers sees an England which is closed off. And so we can just picture down to um, a certain section of society in Manchester. There are a number of problems there. One of the problems is that right now uh, we're seeing Brexit, which is a, a way of moving away from the multicultural um, Britain that we have known, that I have always known. You know, I was talking about in, in, in Marginalia, I was writing about how um, I first grew up on The Cosby Show, actually, um, and also Lenny Henry who came from a town just down the road, you know, and I watched a lot of his stuff um, as a kid and loved it. <coughs> there was one show in particular that was about a, uh, a pirate radio DJ, which I've written about recently. And the problem is that kind of in this Call Them Soldiers, there has been a real turn away from that. And... Essentially, there's been a process that I, I... A lot of these things are, are borrowings from Prague's history and the history in Central Europe. So essentially, if, if, if Britain is going to close, you're going to see history happening in a way that happened and was more typical for other areas of the world, including Central Europe. So I've got essentially the underground university is, is in operation there, <coughs> which was something that happened over here, and it was England sending people over to to work for the underground university. Roger Scruton, a, a conservative philosopher, was very um, important in that aspect. And that helped to, to a certain degree, to a, to a, a degree that could be discussed, um, it helped form the, the philosophy of the, the distant movement here. So the underground university is on operation, um, but also we see something there, which is similar to Asanatsa, which happened here, where the Jewish quarter was completely kind of destroyed and re redeveloped. 
Um, and that happens in Call Them Soldiers with the, the soft power corporation called Globus Albion, which creates these huge film projects. It's, it's, it's kind of patriotic um, films which are there to, to, to bring everybody together. They're films based on Shakespeare and other plays from England's history and films based on our, our glorious history. And the sets that are designed for these films are... They just lay waste to entire towns and areas of towns in order to recreate these sets that are based upon a certain period of England's history and to recreate them in some kind of authentic fashion and then the set remains afterwards and is sold to um, to people who move into those areas which are gentrified in this really brutal way. And what happens then is we see, we, we're in the atheist quarter, we see the, 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 the um, <coughs> Catholic quarter, the Christian quarter, and all of these different areas of town which represent, I guess now, the... Um, the echo chambers of, of social media, but in physical form. We don't see the Muslim quarter, and uh, there are other areas that we don't see as well, and we don't bump into different people. We just see, we see classes, we see kind of um, these cliques, these buckets almost, it's sometimes called in, in, in the, the world of algorithms, um, where people are filtered into these different buckets and sorted and those become areas, and you move steadily towards the area, and you might feel yourself being kind of slightly pushed over time, you're moving towards somewhere else, and that's, the algorithms have slightly, you know, felt that you should be over here, you know, it's, it's, it's suddenly difficult for you to, to maintain a job in this area of town, which happens to be the Catholic quarter, or the atheist quarter, or whatever it is, and you're moving somewhere else, and at the same time, you feel your, your, your beliefs are changing as well, and it feels like a natural process, but is it? Um, how much are you in control of it? And what happens is that Muslims and other kind of minorities end up as what I call throughout the negative space. It is essentially the, the areas of people, the, the, the communities that the Eudaemon does not understand well. And suddenly these, there are communities which become um, deprecated, I keep saying. <coughs> if you're deprecated, you're essentially, it's a form of genocide. Um, you suddenly are erased in terms of understanding. There's just that area of experience is not understood anymore, and it ceases to be. If you were there, you will drift towards something which is better understood, because the algorithms will force you towards that. What this means is that England is homogenous. It's homogenous in the way that the Czech Republic wants to be now, in the way that the, the Visegrad Four nations want to be now. You know, uh, No, we don't have difference, we won't have any refugees because we are all the same. And we're all the same because essentially we, we threw out and murdered all of, the, all of the Jews back in the Second World War and then perhaps threw out or murdered the Germans after the Second World War, for example. Well, the narrative frame in any case, the question came to be, and especially with Trump, how much can we say that the future is, or how representative is England? Is England, and we won't know within Call Them Soldiers themselves <coughs> if it remains so closed. You see all of the political system and exactly how the culture operates in this small country, but you don't see outside. With a lot of things that were going on, I guess I was listening to a lot of podcasts about nuclear weapons, um, and I was watching Trump and seeing what was going on. Most recently I've been reading Daniel Ellsberg's The 
the Doomsday Machine, which I recommend to all of you. But I've started to ask the question, well, how likely is it that there will not, by that period, be a catastrophic nuclear war or nuclear conflict or a nuclear accident, indeed? And if you look at public intellectuals, they call them, or, you know, people who have expressed an idea about this, the odds of humanity surviving the next 50 years are often pretty low. It's kind of disturbing to see who thinks how low they are. <coughs> and so the question became, well, will there have been a nuclear war? What will happen? And the question also was, well, this is pretty bleak in England. And what can happen... What will the readers see when they read this? Because if they read this, they're saying that, okay, in, in 2061, let's say, we will be completely owned. We will be manipulated to a degree that we don't even know that we're being manipulated, which is possibly the case already, let's, let's face it. Um, but can we come back from that? So one of the ideas for the narrative frame was to say, okay... Um, Let's say that we're looking at, at England from the outside, and maybe then there is a way to, to, to solve all of this. I think that was one of the reasons it came to be, and, it, and, and I was really pushed towards the, the necessity of writing this, but I resisted it for a long time, and I resisted it for this following reason. Um, I am now exploring Call Them Soldiers and England from a different perspective, because now I'm a citizen of the Republic of, uh, the Republic of Ireland um, for just over a year, a year and a half in fact now. Um, because of Brexit, my parents are Irish and I decided, look, I actually want to express that side of my heritage. I'm, I've not been in Britain for a long time. I left first in 2004, despising the place. I had never felt good there. And... Um, he started asking the question, well, you know, England is this very hierarchical society. You've got all of these classes and everything else, and you will never feel good, I thought about myself, because of that. Um, especially being as marginal as I am. So then, looking again at English history, um, from the perspective of Ireland, more so than I had for a, a number of years, I, I read a lot about Irish history in periods before, and I'd read Irish literature again in periods before, but had never consistently kind of looked at things from that perspective. It was at one point while listening to a podcast called The Irish Passport that I came across a story where the Choctaw Nation had sent funds to Ireland to support to support people who were, were being affected by the Great Famine, the Great Hunger. I had come across similar stories like this before, which are invariably very, very inspirational. Um, a, a similar one, that, as it occurs to me now, was when the miners of Wales sent funds to rebuild the village Lidice, which had been destroyed by the Nazis in revenge for the assassination of um, Reinhard Heydrich, um, the Reich Protector of um, Bohemia and Moravia. And this seemed similar to me. I developed an idea of what I called the Literary Famine Walk program. The Famine Walk was the original a kind of twinning of the cultures and the, the history of colonisation of the Choctaw Nation and the Irish at the hands of the British, of the Americans and, uh, and, and the colonialists in general. And here I had the Literary Famine, famine Walk programme. 
and it involved this kind of a network and and the story of the the narrative frame so history is on the make it's, it's the story of this horizontal network um, a kind of community based network <coughs> and this is a riff on a lot of the um, technological kind of political developments of the last few years and those who know about those will, will understand what I'm referring to uh, but it's called the Blunton Server Transport and this was created by a woman called Hunter who moved back to the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma in the 2050s, I think I've got it down in, which is unfortunately the last days of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma before they have to move uh, following the breakdown of the United States of America, the, the Federation. Um, and they move ultimately to the Yukon. Um, up in what remains Canada. The thing is that in transferring the point of view to America and then to the people who had always been subjugated in America and who had never been permitted to um, have any control over that history of America and of their own fates, they hadn't been permitted over the last 200 years, Looking back through the end of the, of the collapse of, of the American empire and um, the American experiment, essentially. And so then one of those um, purposes of the narrative frame has not come to be. That means that we're not looking back in this very optimistic sense. Um, the the template almost I had taken from that, or rather the um, the way I had framed that dilemma in a sense, the way I had framed that decision as regards the narrative frame, was by Thomas Pynchon's analysis of The, the, the pamphlet that is at the end of 1984, which I don't actually have here. And I realised, uh, interestingly enough, the, um, the pamphlet was not at the end of the translation of 1984, which is here in the Czech Republic, which I found the one time. So, it's a, um, what do you call it? It's the appendix, which is the history of Newspeak, essentially. Now, Thomas Pynchon analyzes this and says that, well, actually, although 1984 is unremittingly depressing um, and pessimistic, actually, this is framed by the history of Newspeak, which talks in the past tense. So that period is over. So not this boot stamping on a human face forever. There was no forever. It ended, uh, just as the period of communism ended here um, as well in 1989. So that aspect of the narrative frame that it makes it rather more that it sweetens the medicine is, is not really now the case. And there are two ways of looking at that. You can either project forward and say, look, where are we heading? Because a dystopia it's very much about now, and saying that, you know, if we project from now, what's going to happen? Um, and so my dilemma. There is, I could continue with, Call Them Soldiers set in Manchester. Um, I, I stopped it back in November. I was really trying to work on the structure and things like that. Should I simply have pushed on with the structure and continued it? Then I had the histories on the make. And I started that as the narrative frame. I've got all kinds of questions about the morality of doing that, which I want to approach one day in an essay. I guess I'm going to call it... Well, I won't say. I originally had planned to call it Failing Better. Uh, and then I found that there is a... Um, I think it's by Zadie Smith. There's an essay 
of the same title. Now, it's very much the same theme. But on that basis as well, can I write about the Choctaw Nation? Is it, is it possible for me to do so? And the question there is, but it's one that I've been confronting over and over again this time, and was confronting over and over again with previous projects, such as those that are called Rafting the Tigris, and what was the other one? Um, Going Dark, which is about a trans woman uh, from America, um, kind of going through a um, <coughs> sex reassignment surgery, gender reassignment surgery. So there you go. I should, do I even have the right to say this? Uh, gender reassignment surgery in Berlin. Now, first of all, there's the thing that, that, that I'm so naturally a writer, I'm so naturally Im imagine myself into certain, certain, certain situations, but I guess that's my way of exploring them, is the thing. I, do, I don't write about what I know best most of the time. Um, now and again I've tried to do that, but, uh, but a lot of the time I'm really moving forward to try and experience something and learn about something. That's my way of learning about something. Um, and that's what I'm doing with the Choctaw Nation, essentially, here. Which means that I'm writing something that I know very little about while trying to kind of very quickly, um, okay, where am I? And then try to gauge myself and, and, and take my bearings and then move forward. Um, which gives me a lot of kind of moral dilemmas about doing that. Um, I think that nobody should be banned from imagining into it to any kind of person's life because that is a form of empathy and, tr and, and attempt at empathising them more. And also what it does is it shows your assumptions which might be wrong and then others can correct them. That's how you learn is by having a conversation about, you know, I think this. Well, you're wrong, clearly, you know. Um, people can correct me in that sense. Um, but also there's the thing that if I'm developing in a, in a, in a kind of, I have, um, it's open source in some ways, and then others can file issues and can... Um, can tell me what I need to correct. Now, nevertheless, it has grown into a novel itself. So the question now is, do I continue through the rest and to write the novel? Or do I take the first chapter, which I've kind of, I finished a draft of the first chapter, do I tidy up that draft and tidy up the other drafts that are associated with issue zero of Marginalia? Try to issue that in some way, get people reading it, develop some interest in Marginalia, and then hope that somebody will kind of um, donate to the development of the project. Because right now, nobody's donating any money. I'm not earning any money. So my girlfriend's here earning money. And um, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of money here and there from my parents. And, um, and I'm writing every day. Um, and one of the other difficulties is, I guess, you know, is this just me moving on from one project to another to another all of the time and will I continue doing that? So, in any case, the main issue now is whether to continue with the novel or whether to tidy up that first um, issue of Marginalia and include the first chapter of the novel within it, which would mean not continuing now and, and writing on from the first chapter into chapter two, but going over the other issues, the other um, articles that I've started to write into Marginalia issue zero, <coughs> making a finished product of that, and then getting that to market with the hope that people will donate money to it. Um, and that if I do some of these videos explaining what I'm trying to do, that people will try to donate money to it, and so on. Um, so that's my dilemma right now. I've talked for a lot longer than I hoped to, um, but I guess that's what I wanted to say. So thank you if you've, if you've listened this far.